in full zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises Inc. Good day, everyone. Nestor Lecanto here. Welcome to another edition of In Full Zoom. And it's uh, really a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce our guests today, who are actually from the great state of Hawaii. Let me start with uh, someone you probably know and remember from way back when, when he was a K KUAM uh, news anchor and reporter and also worked for the CNMI, uh, Senator Glenn Wakai from the Hawaii Senate. He is the Hawaii Senate Chairman on Economic Development, Tourism, and Technology. Half a day, Glenn. Half a day. Good to be back with you, Nestor. Okay. Also joining us today is uh, Keith Regan, who is the Chief Administrative Officer for the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Half a day, uh, Keith. Hello, Nestor. Thank you for having me here. We have a pleasure to have you. And Tina Yamaki, last but not least, of course, President of the Retail Merchants of Hawaii. Half a day, Tina. Half a day and aloha. Aloha. And as you might have guessed from the titles that I just uh, uh, said, uh, that uh, these folks uh, are all involved in uh, the tourism industry and the economy. And so that's going to be our topic today. Um, maybe what we can learn uh, on Guam based on Hawaii's experience and what they're going through, because our economy in Guam is always sort of tied to Hawaii in a way in which um, uh, we kind of mirror what your t tourism industry um, has done for your state. Uh, it has also done for Guam, but of course, at this point, um, we're both um, suffering from a lack of tourism. Just to give you guys an update, um, Guam was supposed to have uh, tried to reopen on the 1st of July. Um, that was uh, postponed indefinitely after about a week before um, the 1st of July. There was a bit of a spike in positive cases, so the governor decided that she would put that on hold indefinitely. What uh, we were going to do was um, kind of lift the 14-day quarantine um, from three key markets for us, which are, of course, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, but uh, that's now been put on hold. Um, and um, so we're not sure at this point um, when we are going to be able to um, reopen the tourism industry. So as that is the background, uh, let me uh, ask you first, Glenn, to give us kind of a, an update on um, Hawaii's economy and, and, the, and the state of it right now. Well, Nestor, as you mentioned, Hawaii's economy mirrors that of Guam, where it's tourism is number one, the federal government is our number two uh, investor in creating economic vitality here. And when you break it down even further, tourism is 17% of our economy. It generates about $18 billion of our GDP in the state. And these are terrible times for us here in, in the Aloha State. We are suffering through 22% unemployment and from a government perspective we're seeing our eight billion dollars in annual uh, revenues drop about two, little over two billion dollars so we are from a state level uh trying to hold it together thank goodness for the federal government to provide us uh, a lot of relief but i think it's going to be hard times for us by the end of the year I, i'm pretty sure we're going to have to start furloughing and even laying off some of our government employees as more and more of our business sector just kind of just disappears. Um, similar to uh, Guam, Hawaii has decided on August 1st that we are going to start to try and reopen tourism to a small extent by requiring testing, not requiring, but to offering uh, pre-testing prior to the individuals getting on the flight. And we're hoping that most will avail themselves to that and not bring their potential illnesses here. Uh, but there's obviously pukas and holes with that approach. Uh, so we are kind of still not clear on what the plan is going to be um, come August 1st. And Keith Reagan will probably talk a little bit more about what that plan might be, but uh, it, it, we don't want to be like Guam, where we come August 1st, we realize, uh oh, this thing is terrible and we don't have our protocols right, and we're gonna pull back because that would probably be the worst case scenario. So we are really relying on uh, the Hawaii Tourism Authority, airlines, and all of our partners here to hopefully make August 1st a pretty good opening um, and slowly revitalize our economy because right now there is almost no economic activity in the state of Hawaii. Yeah, and um, as the Senator said, Keith, could you just give us an, an update on how the HTA is uh, dealing with this crisis right now? 
Yeah, so thanks, Nestor. You know, as the good senator mentioned, you know, uh, tourism plays a huge role in our, our economy, and that's no big surprise, you know, for anybody that's ever been to Hawaii, very similar to Guam, right? And, you know, we are, we're definitely struggling with, you know, how do we open the economy safely? And I think that's the big uh, focus for us is how do we ensure a safe experience, not only for our visitors, but especially for our residents and for those who are working in the industry who are going to be interacting with um, with, res with visitors who are, are coming to our shores. And August 1st currently is the date that's been set by the governor. Um, this is, you know, something that we're all marching towards in terms of trying to figure out um, the best approach to keep people safe. Um, and as, as Senator Wakai mentioned, uh, we are looking at the 72-hour window for pre-testing for anyone who wants to come to Hawaii to avoid the 14-day quarantine. Right now, as it stands, Nestor, there's a 14-day uh, mandatory quarantine for anybody that um, is visiting here uh, or in Hawaii, actually visitor or resident that's coming back to the state of Hawaii. And, you know, this is a big challenge for us because, you know, we have to um, ensure that that's being enforced. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of uh, resources are, are put towards that. And what we don't want to do is reopen the economy only to have all of those resources then applied, you know, to having to track down and, and find people who are, you know, not following the quarantine requirements or maybe not coming in with the testing. And so, as uh, Senator Wakai mentioned, we're, we're working towards uh, making sure that the process are, uh, processes are in place, you know, to ensure that, you know, we're not missing anybody, that, um, you know, people that are coming to our shores, you know, are in fact being tested uh, properly. And, you know, we can't really differentiate between visitors and residents that are traveling back to, to the state of Hawaii. So we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we have to treat everybody the same that's coming in. Um, on these arriving flights. And so it's, it is a huge undertaking for us, but it's extremely important. As Senator Wakai mentioned, tourism is, is the biggest economic engine for the state of Hawaii. And, you know, with $18 billion in revenue, that's essentially, you know, trickled down to nothing. Um, we also get $600 million in transit accommodation tax, which, you know, really goes towards supporting our overall um, state budget. And so, this is, a, this is a huge gap that we're trying to fill, and it's a critical gap that we need to fill, um, and, but we need to do it safely. And, and that is obviously the, the biggest um, push for us and the biggest concern is making sure that you know, our hotels, our airlines, our retail, our merchants, you know, anyone that's involved in this industry is, it has the protocols in place um, you know, to keep not only our visitors and residents that are returning safe, but also you know, those who are working in the industry as well. And so. You know, we're all we're, we're all in this together, and I think we can all learn from each other. Um, you know, and Guam and and the state of Hawaii. You know, we have so much in common. You know, we, we we share so many similarities, and you know, we obviously can learn a lot from each other in the way that we approach the reopening of our economies. But we we as as you folks there in Guam want to make sure that we do it the right way, and the only way we can do that is if we all you know are, are aware of these safety protocols and and. Um, you know, marching towards that direction. Yeah, and I'm safety. Sure. Yeah, safety and health is absolutely a, one of the big, big messages here as well. In full zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In full zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises Inc. Tina, I wanted to ask you about the impact of the tourism on the retail industry in, in Hawaii. I know, for example, like um, some of our bigger tourism um, related mm -hmm. stores like um, D DFS have kind of shuttered for now. Um, we've had like a um, Forever 21 just closed down permanently. Um, they just kind of left the stuff in the store and told the shopping mall to. You guys do what you have, what you want with it, uh, but we're not coming back. So, Tina, what's what's it look like? Uh, what's the picture for the retail industry in, in Hawaii? Well, it's very gloomy right now. Um, just to give you guys some background on Hawaii retail numbers, the industry was one of the largest employers in the state. We employ about 25% of the labor force here in Hawaii. And statewide, last year, we had over 18,400 retail establishments. And that supported over 205,000 jobs. Um, and our direct um, GDP impact was $12.2 billion on the state. 
Hawaii also has some of the largest flagship stores and some of the top grossing national and international stores and locations here, but that all changed when the pandemic started and everything closed down. Um, those retailers that were essential that had food or toilet paper or cleaning products, you know, they were all doing pretty good because people were going there, everybody needs to eat. Everybody else had to close down. And we're so dependent on tourism, whether it's directly or indirectly, where directly where the tourists come and they buy that one thing to go back home with, you know, or, you know, everybody buys macadamia nuts and chocolates and coffee to bring back. Um, so all of that has kind of stopped. Um, and then we also have the indirect impact too, is where, you know, all of the hotel workers and the attraction people, they have been laid off and furloughed. So their income has been cut down, you know, um, so they're not shopping as much anymore. We're seeing a lot of people what are called list shopping, where you go into the stores and you buy only what's on your list, what's need to have, what, and whether it's not so much nice to have type of items. And of course, um, you know, with school going on and with the stores kind of reopening, we did do some guidelines to make sure everybody was safe, not only for our customers, but our employees as well. Because if you don't feel safe shopping in our stores, you're not going to come into them and visit us. Yeah. So. Uh, um, Senator and, and also Keith and Tina, if you want to jump in, I, but I just wanted to get a sense of uh, one of the things um, that we're finding in, in our tourism industry uh, in reopening it is we could open, but if the markets that um, normally, um, um, you know, provide us with the, the visitors um, continue to, for example, require returning um, residents, re they're returning uh, countrymen to undergo 14 days of quarantine, they're really not going to travel here. So um, is Hawaii reaching out to those markets um, and uh, uh, trying to convince them that, um, well, actually, what does Hawaii have to do to convince them to let their um, their people, their citizens uh, go to Hawaii? Because that's one of the things that we're trying to tackle here. Um, if we open, that's fine, but um, they also need to um, coordinate with the, those uh, source markets to ensure that um, the uh, visitors will even want to come here. Yeah, I'll just um, I'll answer this really quick, and then and then Senator can kind of um, jump in. But you know, we are actively um, putting together our marketing strategy that's going to be able to go out to those markets um, to inform those markets that you know here's the requirements. This is what you need to do before you come here. You need to get this type of test. You need to get it within 72 hours in order to even get on the plane to come to Hawaii, because otherwise you're going to be stuck in a hotel. I mean, that's the reality of it. And so we need to make sure that all of our branding messages, you know, reiterate that and enforce that so that when people are deciding to book their trips to Hawaii from, you know, some of our major markets that, you know, they understand this is what I need to do in order to go to Hawaii and have a great experience. As long as I've got my test results back and it's negative, as long as I have the specific type of test, um, as long as I have these types of credentials with me when I arrive um, here in, in Hawaii, you know, I'll be okay and I can go out and I can enjoy myself when I'm here in the within the state of Hawaii. If I don't have these things, then I'm gonna be stuck. And so all of our messaging is gonna be around that. In fact, we, um, we're just putting the final touches on what that messaging is gonna look like. And we wanna make sure that we, um, we deliver it in a very clear and concise way um, to our markets. And because it's so important, we don't want people to come here and then all of a sudden they're like, well, I didn't know that I didn't have to have this, that I had to have this certificate or I had to have this type of test and not that type of test. You know, and I've just spent thousands of dollars to come here. We don't want our visitors to have a bad experience. And so that brand message, that message that we put out there to the market is so critical. And we want to make sure it's crafted properly. So we put a lot of thought and effort into that process because once it's done and out there, I mean, there's not much you can do to pull it back. And so we want to make sure that it's delivered appropriately. And I'm sure Senator has more, you know, to share about that. We Nestor, we're trying to pursue what's called like a bubble relationship with certain low infection countries. So trying to create a, like a memorandum of agreement with Hawaii and Japan, uh, also looking at Taiwan, uh, Australia. The problem is nobody wants Americans, right? We're the most infected country on the planet right now. So it doesn't matter what gives and what testing and whatever we try to do, uh, they're going to be very suspicious people, not suspicious people, but there's going to be, be a lot of uh, contemplation, like, you know, I don't really want America's people. And that's where Hawaii is trying to be different, right? Like all of a sudden, 
but we just celebrated Fourth of July. Woohoo! Great to be an American. But at the same time, Hawaii saying like, but we're not really part of America. We're different. We have low infection rates. So Japan. Send your visitors to us. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about going to California and elsewhere, but come to Hawaii. So it's kind of uh, interesting how we're trying to carve out Hawaii as similar, but not really America. You're, you're, you're non-contiguous. You're not, you're not physically part of the United States. We're not part of the continent, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality. Um, and that's, that's really, I think, the beauty of living on an island, right? I mean, is that we are, we are our own ecosystem in a sense, right? And so... You know, we've done such a great job, you know, through the senator and through the governor and, and the departments in terms of keeping, you know, this, um, this virus at bay, right? I mean, we've done a great job compared to other places throughout the continental United States. And, you know, people want to come here, as Senator was saying, people from Japan, they want to travel to Hawaii, but because of this, because we are not our own country, we can't, it's very difficult for us to create these um, bubble environments, but we continue to push for that because, you know, it's something that would really, I think, help to open up our economy, even though Japan was probably, what, about 20%, I think, or international travel is about 20% of our overall um, visitor makeup. It's still an important piece, right, to this puzzle for us. So anyways, um, yeah. Yeah, so Japan, Japan brought in 1.6 million tourists here out of our 10 million total. So they're a significant, and just like in, they're big spenders too, right? They're not the cheap frugal spenders travelers they're the big big spenders so we all of us i mean that's that's the golden goose right is the japanese and uh chinese travelers actually spend more money but uh but that's we're, so we're trying to pursue these kind of mous with various countries but uh as, as keith was mentioning sometimes our isolation is to our advantage and sometimes it's to our disadvantage so in this particular case because we're not part of the contiguous U.S., we're trying to use it to our advantage to say, hey, Japan, we're part of America, but we're not really Americans, so bring your folks here. The problem for us, though, is how do we stop the Californian from stopping here who may be infected and then going to Tokyo from here, right? We, we can't figure out how we keep all Americans out of Hawaii who might eventually travel to Japan. So until we kind of figure out how all of those pukas are going to get filled, I don't know if we're going to ever create a MOU with Japan or any other country. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. How close are you folks um, um, talking with, I'm sure pretty close, uh, with the airlines, with the hotels, with the tour operators, and coming up with ideas on on how to solve these these various issues that are going to pop up. Well, there's constant communications occurring um, between the industry and government um, because that's the only way we're going to get through this, right, Nestor? I mean, is we have to work collaboratively. You know, Tina's been engaged. I know on, on many levels, and and as well as you know others within the industry. You know, to make sure that you know we're able to come up with these plans. And, and you know, the, the great part about living in Hawaii, and I'm sure it's the same with Guam, is, you know, we all have different connections, right? We all, you know, have different um, areas where we can reach out to, you know, and leverage some of those relationships that we have. And I know Senator's got some outstanding relationships, and Governor does, and I'm sure Tina does, and, and others within the industry, to be able to engage in those conversations and think outside of the box, especially with the bubble um, relationships that, you know, Senator Wakai's talking about. So it, it really is a collaborative effort between all of us. Yeah. Tina, let me ask you this. Um, I want, one of the things, the issues that has come up here is a lot of residents are fearful of bringing in people. Um, they're saying, you know, we've managed to contain the virus very well. We don't really want people coming here right now. But, you know, obviously that's very essential to, to your, uh, your industry. Um, can you can you tell me what the reaction is of the the uh, the Kama Aina in, in Hawaii to opening up tourism again? You know, I, I think it's a little twofold. I think there is a misconception that they think August first, when Hawaii opens up tourism, it's going to be a mass flooding of people coming back in, and and we don't anticipate that. When stores got to open up, they thought it was going to be like Black Friday, and it's going to be these crowds of people. When in fact, it wasn't. Um, 
coming to Hawaii is more vacation oriented. So it's not like a decision of I'm going to go to the supermarket today. It takes a little bit of planning and a little bit more money and everybody's a little um, money conscious right now, no matter where you are in the world. And I think as long as there is a mousetrap that is secure, that makes sure that everybody coming into Hawaii, um, you know, is tested, they're COVID free for the most part that we know of, you know, to the best of our abilities. Um, I think it's going to be a little safer environment and people are going to be more comfortable. But until that plan rolls out and we know exactly what's going on, not just from visitors from the mainland, but from other international countries as well. Yeah. Uh, Senator, how do you reassure your community that it's okay to reopen tourism at this time for those um, who are, are doubtful or still, or still fearful? Uh, I have a hard time reassuring my community because I don't really believe in the plan that we have uh, on the books at the moment. I mean, this idea that people can choose to pre-test pre before getting on the plane to me is ridiculous. We have to either, you're either all in or you're all out. We have to pre-test everybody on that plane or not. I mean, how in the world can half of us on the plane be tested, half of us potentially be dirty? In five hours coming to Hawaii, guarantee the dirty guys are going to infect the clean guys. So th this idea of us having uh, some kind of a containment with people choosing to test, to me, is a ridiculous proposition. We either test prior to their departure, which is ideal, uh, or when they come to Hawaii, we test everybody coming off the plane. But we can't have half, half the people tested and half the people not. To me, that is a glaring hole in the plans that we have currently for October, or excuse me, August 1st rollout. Is, is the state of Hawaii equipped to at this point, um, both um, logistically and uh, financially, to be able to do that sort of um, um, testing on arrival? No, we can do a maximum of 3,500 tests locally. Right now, I think we're getting about 2,000 visitors. Uh, during the peak, we were getting 30,000 uh, arrivals a day. So keep in mind, so we have 3,000 uh, that we can test now. And uh, so we have to increase, capacity. But my view is we had a one month launch period to try and increase capacity, right? We have a uh, private sector as well as government testing laboratories that we should have, in my opinion, been telling them to, you know, gear up, buy more equipment, uh, ramp up your opportunity to test locally. Uh, but that hasn't happened. We're actually looking to the mainland and CVS pharmacies to be our partners in testing people pre-arrival rather than uh, coming here and bulking up our availability and opportunity to test locally. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more In information. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. Yeah. Keith, Keith what's, what kind of advice can you give to the Guam Visitors Bureau, which is your counterpart, um, uh, about um, how to um, go about um, talking to um, the governments of Japan, of South Korea, and to a lesser extent, um, Taiwan, about um, inviting their citizens to come to our island? I mean, we've got a much smaller um, um, island to um, kind of protect them. Um, but uh, what are, what's your advice? I, I think the most important thing is that um, they, they, meaning the, the governments of these, these other countries, they want to know that their citizens are going to be safe. They want to know that when, when their, their citizens travel to Guam or, or you know, to Hawaii or wherever it is that they're going within the world, that, um, that the protocols are in place to keep their citizens safe. And so that when they return to their home country, whether it be Japan or Korea or you know, Australia or New Zealand, that their citizens are not bringing back infection with them, right? And so I think that's really, you know, one of the most important um, pieces of advice that I can give is that, you know, when you're engaging in these conversations with these other countries is to kind of let them know, like, look, these are the protocols. This is what we've put into place. This is how we're going to keep your citizens safe when they come here. This is the kind of experience that they're going to have when they come to our shores, when they stay in our hotels, when they drive, when they ride in our, our public transportation when they go to our retail outlets, when they go to the restaurant, you know, to go and eat, you know, dinner or lunch, you know, these are the safety protocols that we have in place. Everything we've done 
is done in a way to keep both our, our visitors as well as our residents safe um, on every level. And I think just reassuring them that these things are in place and they're in place for a reason. And these are the criteria that we're going to utilize when we're, you know, faced with something that may, you know, pop up as an example. Um, you know, I think, you know, the Senator brings up some really good points about testing and, you know, and those types of requirements and, you know, how do we, you know, how do we make that even stronger than what it currently, or what it potentially is going to be. But I think if Guam can relay that, you know, to those governments that, these are, these are the things that we've put into place. What else would you like us to see? What else would you like to see that you're not seeing that would make you feel more comfortable um, to allow your citizens to come to Guam or even to Hawaii as an example? You know, what is it that you need to feel comfortable and confident that your citizens can have a great, safe experience and be able to return home and not have to be put into an, another 14-day quarantine as an example? Because that's the big challenge that we have right now is, Let's say, as an example, we could open the door, you know, to allow Japan uh, visitors to come here. But, you know, to go back home, they're going to have to be in quarantine for 14 days. And no one wants to go through that kind of experience, right? So I think if you can have that in place, you know, to resolve that type of an issue would be a huge win for, for Guam, as it would be for Hawaii. Because, you know, and I'm sure Tina can speak to this. I was in Waikiki um, over the weekend, and that place is just... It's a ghost town. It's sad. When I walk around Waikiki and I see a lot of these merchants who, you know, they're open, but there's no one in, in the store, you know, um, to buy their merchandise. You know, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, how long can that last? Because it's so critical that we get our visitors here. But um, again, we got to do it safely. And we also have to make sure that our residents, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, are ready to welcome visitors, you know, to our shore. And that, I think that's the other piece too, um, Nestor, is that, you know, Guam has to make it very clear that, you know, we as residents of Guam, you know, are ready to accept visitors from your country or from your region to come back and, 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 and be a part of our, our experience here. Tina, let me ask you the question that Keith asked. Um, how long can those merchants hold out? They're not. Um, it, it's really sad what's going on. Um, you know, a lot of them have different multiple locations. So the locations that are where the locals tend to shop, their stores are open. Um, those that are in the resort areas, they're having a hard time. They haven't paid their lease rent, you know, in the last few months because there was no income in there. Um, some opened and a few days later they closed because no customers were coming in. One even told me she had a negative day because somebody came and returned stuff to her, you know. And every time we turn on the lights and open up the door, it cost us money. Um, so we are seeing more and more businesses that are quietly closing. A lot of icon places um, have closed down or, or have decided not to open anymore. They just can't survive. And they know, yes, August 1st is the date to open, but like I said, everyone's not gonna be coming on August 1st. It's gonna be probably later, a couple months later, and they just can't, a lot of them just can't afford to wait. Some haven't even paid their home rent. So they're gonna, they're asking, you know, I'm probably gonna have to sell my house or move in with relatives. Yeah, that kind of supports the argument that I have been hearing a lot more of lately. And that is that more livelihoods are being lost in this pandemic than lives are being lost. And I'm wondering, um, Senator um, Wokai, can you comment on that? Yes, I mean, it's a delicate balance, though. I mean, because from a state perspective, one of government's core obligations to the public is public safety and health. Everything else is secondary to that core mission. Uh, but as you mentioned, that comes at a price. I mean, Hawaii has flattened the curve, but that's come at a huge expense, as Tina mentioned, of all the folks that just, just are having a hard time making ends meet here. So... I, I, I don't think any of us on this call have an idea of what that date is and what that cure is. We're all hopeful, but you know, I am always a believer that hope is never a strategy. We, we've got to be doing something to, to balance things out. So that's why August 1st is our effort to try and balance some of that out. We know we're going to open ourselves up to risk, but that we have to take that because otherwise the status quo is just killing our community. But Nestor, to your earlier question that you posed to Keith as to what Guam can do, the best thing Guam can do is keep that, 
that uh, the pandemic under control, right? As long as you keep that infection rate down, you have an ob opportunity to, to engage other countries in some kind of MOU. The moment you start looking like California, nobody on this planet is going to talk to Guam. So the first thing is just keep the infection rate low. But one thing that we also have to be, we're concerned about here in Hawaii is now come August 1st, you're going to be a lot of, half the crowd is going to say like, great, let's open things up. Half are going to be fearful, like, uh-oh, we're inviting the pandemic and in infection into our state. So what we're worried about is as tourists become, come here, how are the locals going to react? Are the locals going to be irritated and just start assaulting, yelling, and making a terrible visitor experience? Because that would be even more detrimental. Hawaii generally has 60 to 70% return visitors, right? We, we want people to come back over and over and over again. But if you come over here and people are flattening your tires, yelling at you, holding signs outside your hotel room, that is a crappy experience. And I'm going to go to some other destination in the future. So that's something that we are kind of conscious about as we try to find that delicate balance between economic revival and making sure that we are not uh, hurting public health here in Hawaii. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. Yeah, go ahead, Tina, go ahead. No, I was going to say, the other thing that um, people know about is when we have the 14-day quarantine like we have right now, if you're caught breaking it, we actually arrest you. And that we're one of the very few, if not the only state that does that. And so it, the word has kind of gone out, too, that, you know, we arrest tourists, you know. So I, 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 I read the I read those news stories. <laughs> Keith, I was going to ask you, what, what is uh, HTA doing about that? Because it is, like uh, the senator said, a dual uh, mission. Uh, you want to attract visitors, but you also want to reassure the local community that it's okay to bring them in. So how, how is uh, HTA handling that? Again, that's, I think I spoke to that a little bit earlier about the protocols and making sure that, you know, the hotels have proper safety protocols in place and that they're following them and that they've you know, gone through these steps to ensure that their workers are kept safe, because that's, I think, is the most important thing, right? You have lots, you have, you know, thousands of employees that are working in the hotel industry and, you know, making sure that they're not being infected or, you know, coming into contact with somebody, you know, inadvertently who might be infected, I think is really critical. So making sure that, you know, our employees feel confident and safe and secure, you know, when they're going back to work, um, whether it be in the hotel or restaurant or whatever industry, related to the visitor um, experience, I think is gonna be extremely critical. Um, you know, beyond that, I mean, I think it's really making sure that we communicate with the public, the protocols, the steps that we've taken to, you know, to try to address, you know, um, the, the uh, potentially infected individuals who might be coming in and, and trying to stop that, right? By having the pretests in place, you know, and we're not gonna catch every single person, right? That's just not realistic. But we will make sure that we have the proper layers that exist to prevent that, at least to try to address that. So as soon as someone is identified as not being well, um, is isolating those people, quarantining those individuals, making sure that they get tested, making sure that they have access to, you know, uh, medical care, so that they're not out there roaming around in the streets, you know, and, and spreading, you know, potentially virus. And let, let's not forget, I mean, we're talking about coronavirus and COVID-19, but we still have flu, we have colds, we have, you know, all these other things that we need to be worried about, right? And so regardless of whether they have COVID or some other disease, I think it's really important that, you know, when visitors do come here and they do start to feel ill, that we let them know it's okay to stay in your room. It's okay for you to let us know that you're not feeling well and that, you know, these are things that we can do to help you so that you're not out there on the streets um, and potentially getting people sick. And, you know, I think that's gonna be really important that we relay that to the community and that the community feels confident that government has protocols, government and industry have protocols in place to try to you know, prevent this as much as possible. And the government is not afraid that if it gets out of hand, if, if whatever reason, you know, things don't go the way that we think that they will go, that we're willing to pull it back, you know, to keep people safe, right? That's the other part of it too, right? And I think, you know, as you look at the continental US and, and how they've opened up in certain places and where they didn't have protocols, they didn't have you know, protective measures. They didn't have face masks or face coverings required. Um, they allowed, you know, 
gatherings to occur where you know thousands of hundreds of people were gathering you know and interacting and 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 spreading their germs or whatever you know and how it just got out of control but i think when you look at what hawaii's done you know with having the mandatory face masks with having social distancing with um, making sure that you know again all these protocols are in place we've done a great job at that and and i think we're ready um, but only time will tell right we we have to open up on august for not have to but the goal is to open up on august 1st and to see whether or not those protocols are sufficient to to address that we think the department of health thinks that they are um, the department of health feels that they're ready um, the industry feels that it's ready and so you know now it's just a matter of um, uh, getting to August 1st and and seeing where we go um, you know and and I yes, share to your point I'm sorry go ahead so next year we're, we're pursuing the what I call the three T's in Hawaii it's temperature testing and tracing so temperature, uh, if you were to come to Honolulu International Airport now, you have thermal scre readers, uh, screeners. Before, we had National Guardsmen that put the little temperature gun to your head and find that you're okay and not uh, feverish. Now we have a scanner that's going to be doing that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the testing that's going to be done pre-arrival, uh, and we have some capacity here locally. And then the tracing part is where actually Keith uh, has helped us to put our, what was in the past, kind of a paper of, that you had to fill out. He's put it online, so for, not online, but onto an app so yep. that if you're on the flight okay. or even yep. you get on the flight, you can answer the questionnaire online uh, so that you, it'll be, be easier for us as a state to follow you. And plus, you know, paper, we got, you have to have a data entry guy, put that in, and waste time, waste of manpower. So to Keith's credit, he's come up with the software to provide a questionnaire for the state of Hawaii to, more easily track your whereabouts when you come to the state. Yeah, maybe to turn this to more of a positive note, um, everything I've read and, and heard is that um, once the, the, there's a vaccine or some kind of uh, uh, confidence in uh, that we can control the virus, that there is going to be a huge pent up demand for travel. Uh, can you guys talk about that? Yeah, I mean, everything that we've looked at, we've done a number of surveys. We do, we do all kinds of research. I mean, you know, a majority of what we do at HTA revolves around research and providing information to um, decision makers and policymakers like Senator Wakai. Um, you know, and everything that, that we've looked at, as long as there is some vaccine or there's some way to um, cure, if you will, the virus, uh, people want to travel and they want to come to Hawaii, they especially want to come here because they know that it's safe. Um, and I'm sure similarly with Guam, I mean, it's going to be a very similar thing in situation. Um, but, you know, the, it's going to be, um, you know, making sure that, that, you know, we're ready to accept them back and that their experience is outstanding, you know, and it's an incredible experience. And, uh, but yeah, people want to travel, but they, they're only going to do it if they feel safe and they know that they're not going to get sick. You know, when the floodgates reopen, there's going to be a huge demand to, like, uh, get out and, and, and travel. And it's so ironic because here we are uh, in July, and we're, we're just desperate, like, just bring anybody here. Bring your wallet and fly in from any place. When six months ago, we were having almost a complete opposite discussion in Hawaii as we were kind of going beyond 10 million visitors. There was over-tourism discussion and people were talking about like uh, how do we keep tourists out of these areas how do we better manage tourism so as we op we open tourism i think for hawaii it's a golden opportunity for us to kind of redefine what tourism should be making sure that visitors go to ala moana and go shop at the retail shops but don't go into treacherous hiking spots or places that are going to require them to get airlifted out of out of there uh, so that is a discussion uh, we will have to have here in Hawaii as people and during the di time, times of, of good that's coming. We don't want to reinvent tourism to be exactly the way it was in January of 2020. We want it to be better. And this is also an opportunity for us to kind of remake it uh, so that we are going after the right audiences and keeping tourists in the right places. Good point. Um, yeah, Kathy, go ahead. 
I think for retailers too, I mean, we've seen a very big change too. Tina. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> for retailers. <laughs> <can't>. <laughs> Tina, sorry. <laughs> That's my stage name. Don't tell my secrets. No, but, um, you know, um, <laughs> But for retailers, you know, they've had to really go back and redo their business plan a couple of times. You know, when this whole thing started, nobody knew how global this was going to be or how bad this was going to be. We thought it would be all over within six weeks tops. We'd be back to work. It would be business as usual. So for retailers, we've already gone back and done it. We found out that if you don't have an omni channel, chances are your business is going to be suffering a lot. And what I mean is buy online, pick up at the store, have it sent to your store. A lot of times people don't realize you can still support your local retailers by buying online, um, you know, at the stores that are in your neighborhood and, or, you know, in Guam. So there are ways that it can be done. And, and going back to a previous conversation too, you know, we're always talking about, um, the tourists coming into Hawaii and, you know, once they leave the airport, then what, you know, they have to have masks on too, and they have to be responsible citizens when they come and visit our state as well, because we need to feel safe from them as they need to feel safe from us as well. That's a very good point. Yes. I think that's a message that Guam needs to, to put out there. In full as zoom as well. is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. Keith, so um, have, on this um, line of conversation, what is the... Um, HTA doing in terms of any revamping of the tourism industry, uh, if you will, is that something that um, uh, HTA is doing during this pause? Yeah, I mean, as, as Senator Okai was mentioning, you know, that has been, you know, kind of our focus. We just redid our strategic plan uh, beginning of 2020 and then um, COVID crisis hit. But, um, you know, the goal had been and, and still is to put a lot of focus on um, our natural environment, supporting programs, you know, that, uh, you know, support different things like trail improvements, um, making sure that, you know, visitors have great experiences when they go out and they, they and that they're, they're hiking safely, you know, and they're hiking in the right places or, you know, visiting the right places and not going off the trails, you know, and, and damaging, you know, our very fragile ecosystem, um, you know, and our environment. And so, you know, we, we put a lot of effort into supporting, um, what we call Aloha Aina, which is our um, natural environment, uh, natural resources, natural environment program, you know, at the HTA. In addition to that, we also put a lot of focus on Hawaiian culture. You know, that Hawaiian culture is so important to us, right? I mean, it, it is truly what embodies and, and what makes up Hawaii and what makes it such a unique and special place. And, you know, in the past, you've had these kind of contrived um, experiences, these, uh, you know, that really weren't truly authentic. And, and so, you know, really pushing that authenticity and, and making sure that, you know, the, the culture that's being delivered and shared with our visitors, you know, is such that it's, it's real and they can feel that and, and making sure that we as a Hawaii Tourism Authority are supporting programs that, you know, are in fact authentic and that do bring home that Hawaiian cultural experience and, and make sure that that the Hawaiian culture is preserved and protected. It's so important. You know, it's such an, it's, it's, it is really one of the most important aspects of what we do um, at, at just in general, right? Not just at HTA, but everything we do is focused yeah. around that. And then, you know, obviously supporting our community. So we, we develop these four pillars, which, you know, really guide us in terms of what we do at the HTA. And as I mentioned, it's Aloha Aina, Kukula Ola, which is our Hawaiian culture, um, community enrichment program, which is all of our community programs, and then our branding, which is, you know, makes up about 50% of what we do. But the other 50%, you know, are those three things that I just mentioned, which are huge, you know, for us. And it really is important that we drive that message home that, you know, Hawaii is a great place to come and visit, but we want you to have this amazing experience. We want you to, you know, see our you know, incredibly beautiful environment. We want you to experience our incredibly special and unique culture um, that is the Hawaiian culture. And we want you to have a, a great experience and take that back with you. Share that aloha experience, you know, with your family back. Home when you go and you know and 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 we welcome you back 
Um, and so that's really kind of the focus of what we're doing at the HTA is it's not about brand. It's not only about branding and saying, hey, come to Hawaii and, you know, go to a luau, you know, and, and you know, drink a Mai Tai. No, it's not about that. It's, it's so much more. Um, when you come to Hawaii, you, you can experience so much more and have such a rich um, experience that you can take back with you and, and, and look back on for, for decades. And, and Senator Wakai mentioned 68% of our visitors come back. They're, 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 this is not their first trip. They've, they've come back. Why is it that they're coming back? You know, we want to make sure that that experience is such a special experience that um, for generations they'll be coming back. Yeah, I like the word you use, authenticity, because that's something that uh, Guam is also trying to be pushing. Um, the, in, in similarity to the similarity to the Aloha spirit, we have the Hapa spirit, and um, I think there's a lot of um, effort to try and 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 promote the the local culture um, and. And uh, I think that's something that um, the Guam Visitors Bureau is keying on. And, and, and the Senator, you, you've lived on Guam and, and the CNMI, and you, you, you understand the importance of culture here. And the food, in my humble opinion, on Guam is better than Hawaii. Oh, the barbecues on Guam are so good. There's this thing called Keliguin, red rice. Oh, the chicken is, is awesome in Guam. So that's, that's, I think, one of the selling points that I don't see a lot being sold about the Guam cuisine, which was uniquely different, tangy and very spicy compared to uh, most of the other Pacific Island foods. But N Nestor, can I uh, go back to the question that Keith just responded to and talk about two things that I think as we kind of revitalize and re-image tourism in the future, one of the pain points Hawaii struggled with is short-term vacation rentals. Um, all of a sudden, tourists are not in Waikiki, not in, in the specific tourism areas. They're in our neighborhoods. So all of a sudden, there's people wheeling their luggage down into your cul-de-sac and disrupting the, the, the vibe of that entire neighborhood. We need to, as we re-image tourism, figure out, like, how do we make sure that tourists are staying in the right places where they're welcome? And that goes back to Hawaii has probably the most uh, strictest regulatory permitting environments, and we can't really expand in Waikiki. We have height limitations, density limitations. I want to have the discussion here, like, well, what do you want? Should we have more density in Waikiki or tourist areas? So we take them out of Kailua, take them out of Bililani, take them out of some of our neighborhoods. That's a discussion I like to have as we re-image tourism in the future. And also in Hawaii, so many of our attractions are free. And I think that we need to price, price things properly. So if we don't want as many people trekking up to Diamond Head right now, a million people pay a dollar a year. Why don't we charge them 10 bucks and get half a million people up there, make more money and reduce the impact. And we have not, from a state level, really re-looked at the pricing of some of our visitor attractions. And I think that is important for us to make sure that tourists go to the right places and that we have the right resources to go hire enforcement officers and keep our trails uh, pretty as, as they are in, in postcards. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. You, you mentioned that Air, experience. Yeah, you, you mentioned that Airbnb model. Guam is also dealing with that now, too. Um, those have sprouted up over the last uh, few years, and there's also an issue about uh, taxation. Um, where is, uh, are they be properly being taxed? Because, um, you know, our hotel occupancy tax um, fuels our, the, um, the budgets for the Guam Visitors Bureau, the Guam Economic Development Authority to a certain extent. So um, that needs to be uh, tracked um, because we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, obviously the hotels are impacted by that. Um, so um, yeah, um, maybe that might be a, a subject for our topic for a, a future discussion with you. Um, we be happy to Hawaii. Just, sure, go ahead. Hawaii went through those, those growing pains about two years ago. We kind of put the proper guide guardrails around Airbnb and short-term vacation rentals. So we'd be happy to engage you in that discussion on what Hawaii's learned and what uh, Guam should be pursuing in the future. Yeah, Tina, let me get back to you. Um, it, 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 do you anticipate that the um, retail industry um, as a result of this pandemic and maybe uh, 
re, re imaging of the tourism industry that um, you're going to see some uh, some significant change um, in the way uh, the retail industry does business. I think you're going to see a lot of change no matter where you are. A lot of your favorite stores might not be there anymore. Stores that you've come accustomed to always visiting, they're going to be gone, unfortunately. Um, and we have to look at how can we attract the visitors and we don't think there's going to be a lot of visitors coming in. So how do you get the biggest bang for your buck? You know, so they are looking at other things like online sales. Um, they're looking at social media, TikTok, and all of that, just to keep the customers engaged and to remind them, hey, we're still out there. Our doors might be closed in the resort areas, but you can still um, order from us right now. And when you do come back, we will open our doors. Hopefully, they'll open their doors again and they'll be around to do that. But, you know, I want to get back to the um, Airbnb thing. What we found out, too, is a lot of visitors coming to Hawaii have been staying at illegal B&Bs or Airbnbs. Um, and they're the ones who haven't been really quarantining. So something to look out for, because you do see them, you know, um, you, you don't want to be, you know, um, the person that goes, oh, look at that person just because of this ethnicity or this color skin kind of thing. But, you know, um, you can kind of tell the tourists and they're out and about and, you know, they haven't quarantined for 14 days or you go to Costco and you see them. <laughs> So. Yeah, you know who lives in your neighborhood and that person doesn't look like they're from the neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc. Um, so, we only got to, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, and so what the neighbors have been doing is they're the ones who have been turning them in. We get lots of calls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, so I, I want to just go around to each of you and maybe just give us um, your, um, your best um, lesson learned um, from this pandemic from your perspective in your particular position. Go ahead, uh, let me start with uh, you, Senator Glenn. I think that we've learned the folly of Hawaii being a one trick pony and relying almost entirely on tourism as a driver of our economy. I've been at uh, in the legislature 18 years. For most of those 18 years, I've been trying to push a diversification of our economy, but it's hard, right? When, when times are good, people don't want to change. And it's only when we're in just ashes is when, when people start realizing like, wow, we, maybe we should have other uh, legs to the stool rather than just this one uh, uh, form of, of economic vitality. So I think the lesson learned was as we re-image tourism in the future, I mean, all we know right now is, is, is tourism. So that's the wheel we're going to have to recreate. But after that wheel is recreated, I hope we really have learned from what happened in 2020 and start diversifying Hawaii's economy in the future. All right, uh, to you, Keith. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo that. I mean, I think, you know, having all of our eggs in one basket is a very dangerous thing. And um, I think we've we recognized that, I think, as a state now. You know, tourism is such an important um, aspect and such an important economic driver for us. Uh, but not having something to, to fall back on or to take its place, you know, in the event that something were to devastate it, like what this, what this uh, pandemic has done, um, has really, I think, well, it really opened up our eyes, you know, to that fact. And so, you know, how do we go forward? You know, how do we um, make sure that we're resilient going forward? And you know, so that we don't fall back on this situation happening again, you know? And I think also, I wanna just mention that, you know, it's important that we remain flexible and that we remain open and that we remain, you know, in a, in a state that allows us to um, listen to different ideas and, and accept different, you know, um, perspectives on things, you know, because sometimes we can close ourselves off, right? We can, we forget that there are many, many different um, ways to look at problems. You know? and, and I think just remaining open-minded um, and, and accepting, you know, of different ideas and concepts, because sometimes, you know, just by listening a little bit, you, you know, might, you might have the solution to what it is that you're trying to solve. So uh, that's what I, you know, want to leave you with. Thank you, Keith. And, and finally, uh, Tina. What, what are your lessons learned? 
you know, we've always learned in the industry that you can't, this is how we've done it. This is how we always are going to do it. That doesn't work. You have to keep up with the times. You have to grow. You have to look at new technology and you have to listen to what your customers want. And I think those are the ones that are going to be successful going out of this. Um, you know, We've also learned that partnerships is great. You know, 365 days a year, we're normally competitors, but this um, virus has kind of brought us together. And you're seeing a lot of businesses partnering with each other now, which is a great concept, you know, because like I said, everybody said, you know, we're all in this together and we all want to see us all coming out surviving this pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and to all my guests, a fast, fascinating conversation. So many lessons learned. I, I really appreciate your joining us uh, today for In Full Zoom. Um, Senator Glenn Wakai, Keith Regan from the HTA, and Tina Yamaki of the Retail Merchants of Hawaii. Thank you so much. Thanks for having uh, I'm me. Necessarily, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us, everyone. Till next time, In Full Zoom. Aloha. In Full Zoom is presented to you by Calvo Enterprises, Inc.